Hi everyone, um, my name is Evie, as I said, I'm the IBD dietitian here at St. Mark's Hospital and I'm here today to talk to you about um, eating and drinking when you have a pouch. So what we'll go through today is um, look at some of the nutritional issues that occur when you form a pouch, dietary advice for uh, the new patient that just com has come out of surgery, the established patient, talk about health eating principles. Um, talk about individual foods and how they affect the pouch function and then finish off with some pouch dysfunction disorders uh, such as pouchitis. So um, we all know that when we form a pouch the colon is removed. However the colon is responsible for absorbing water and salt. So you end up with having a, a lot more liquid stool um, and uh, higher in volume. The, the pouch is formed from the last 30 to 60 centimeters of the terminal ileum, which is this, the last bit of the small bowel. And that bit of the small bowel is responsible for absorbing vitamin B12. And we'll go through it in a bit more detail of the effects of that. With regards to um, nutritional implications, um, the removal of a colon will result, as we said, in considerable losses of fluid and salt in the initial six to eight weeks. Um, approximately between 1,200 and 2 litres a day. However, after the initial six to eight weeks, the body does um, adapt. So kidneys adapt and they conserve water and sodium. And there's also an increased absorption in ileum. So eventually losses will decrease. Um, on average, um, people will empty their pouch three to seven times per day, passing approximately 650 grams of stool. <coughs> with, it tends to be more sort of liquid, soft consistency. Uh, so don't necessarily expect a very formed stool coming out of a pouch. As we said before, B12 absorbed because the last bit of the small bowel is used to create the pouch. So some people may have uh, impaired absorption of B12. And some study, studies have um, suggested that. So it's good to be screened for uh, B12 and um, take supplementation if needed. Also, um, bilacyl... Uh, malabsorption might uh, might occur, so you have reduced absorption of bile acids, which these are involved in the di digestion and absorption of fat, so it could potentially lead to fat malabsorption. Um, as the pouch adapts, uh, the long-term aim is to maintain a good uh, health by taking a, a very balanced diet in order to prevent nutritional deficiencies, make sure that you maintain a good pouch function and also maintain a, a healthy weight. It's also important to remember that you need to take adequate fluid and, and salt intake to replace the initial losses uh, that can occur. Um, Postoperatively, the, the new patient is encouraged to introduce food very gradually, starting with a soft, low fiber diet that is easy to digest. And that's because we would like to prevent any blockages and avoid disturbing the internal surgical wound. So um, for the initial two to four weeks, we advise patients to avoid really high fiber foods, things like nuts, seeds, pips, fruit and vegetable skins, uh, peas, sweet corns, mushroom, dried fruits, and so on. And after the initial sort of two to four weeks, we get them to introduce food slowly and ensure that fibrous food are chewed very, very well. Um, as you come out of surgery, it's, uh, we're asking people to sort of choose high energy, high protein foods to try and aid recovery and promote healing and also prevent weight loss. Most of the patients might initially have a reduced appetite, they might struggle to uh, get enough calories and protein in, so it's important to try and eat little and often. Uh, small and frequent meals during that period are a bit easier to manage, so aiming for like four to six smaller meals per day. Um, eating plenty of protein and energy-rich foods to make sure that we get enough uh, protein and calories. Try and go for high-calorie snacks between meals so that you can get um, a lot of calories in small amounts. Uh, and remember that fluids is another way of getting calories into you, getting nutrition into you. So try and potentially limit the amount of tea and coffee or water that you have at that stage uh, that can fill you up without necessarily giving you much nutrition and then maybe go for more nourishing drinks such as milky drinks, yogurt drinks, uh, smoothies, etc. Um, again, it's important to ensure that you get enough 
uh, fluid and, and salt intake. Uh, the aim is for a litre and a half to two litres of fluid per day, depending on your pouch function. Uh, might need to add extra salt to meals. Approximately a teaspoon added to food during the course of the day tends to be sufficient. Um, it's particularly important to watch your hydration levels, uh, especially in, in the hot weather of, or if your uh, pouch output is high. Um, things like a dry mouth or uh, feeling a bit dizzy or headaches can often be an indicator that you're getting a bit dry. Um, also, the colour of your urine is another good indicator. So if you're passing really dark, concentrated urine, that probably means that you are getting a bit more uh, dry and dehydrated. Um, if you do become dehydrated, try to resist and not drink lots and lots and lots of um, fluid and water uh, uh, because that could potentially make the, the uh, problem worse. So it might be worth in that situation to consider antidiarrheal medication um, and oral rehydration solutions such as the St. Mark's electrolyte mix or Diarolite. Um, they have the right concentration of glucose and salt um, to help reabsorb fluid and salt rather than flush, flush everything out of the system. So as the pouch adapts, the aim is to, to follow a healthy, uh, very diet, well-balanced diet, which is based around the different food groups. So this is the um, Eat Well Guide. I'm not sure if you've seen it before or been, are familiar with it. Um, so it pretty much tells us the proportions of all the different food groups that, should, uh, that a diet should be consisting of. Um, carbohydrate is... The, uh, is a very important energy source. It's the first fuel that our body will use uh, to do this sort of the everyday activities that we do. Things like um, potatoes, pasta, cereal, grains, and so on are good carbohydrate sources. Protein is needed for uh, growth and uh, also for uh, wound healing and, and repair. Foods such as uh, meat, lentils, uh, pulses, eggs, nuts, fish, um, and so on are good protein sources. <coughs> Fat is a, is a very concentrated energy source. It helps to protect organs and also has a role in immunity and um, uh, it helps to absorb uh, fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, but as you can see, it should only consist a small part of a diet. So you only get that little bit um, in terms of compared to the other um, of the food groups. Um, so we still need it, but potentially in, in smaller quantities. Fruit and vegetables, as well know, they provide the good source of fiber. They uh, provide vitamins and minerals and antioxidants to help um, prevent damage within the body. So um, we should sort of be aiming for five portions of fruit and vegetables that per day, depending on obviously on the pouch function. Um, and finally, milk and, and dairy. Um, Again, they provide calcium for strong bones and teeth and also vitamins and minerals. And the recommendation is to try and aim for three portions a day. And a portion is uh, a glass of milk, a matchbox size of cheese, or a pot of yogurt. Unfortunately, uh, many people with stomas and pouches uh, seem to be advised to sort of uh, avoid dairy products, unnecessarily in some ways, because it can be a problem for a certain group of people, and it tends to be the sugar, the lactose in the dairy that people tend to react to, but um, that's not in everyone. And even who, in people who are truly, truly lactose intolerant, they can still tolerate small amounts of milk and, and yogurt and cheese. So um, don't avoid dairy unless you've identified a particular link to your symptoms, and if that is the case and you find that it does upset you, it's rather than you excluding a whole food group, it's important to try and get alternatives in, such as lactose-free uh, products or soya-based products, almond milk, and, and so on. There's a, a, a vast variety out there. Now, with um, regards to alcohol, um, try and obviously avoid excessive uh, alcohol intake. So in moderation, the recommendations are 21 units a week for men and 14 units a week for uh, women and try and aim for a, one to alcohol three days per week. A unit equals to a half pint of beer, a pub measure spirit and a small glass of wine. Does anyone know to tell me what a small glass of wine equals to? 
<laughs> Any other takers? I've got 125, 75. 75, yes, going once. Going to <laughs> so it's actually 75 mils. So nothing like the 200 mil glass that we, we all tend to have um, in the evening. Or So it, it looks so small, doesn't it, if you think about it? But it, that's one unit. So. Fourteen, fourteen for men and women. Yeah, they've actually, yeah, they've actually, they've actually have reduced it. You're right. Um, but obviously, the the amount of alcohol that we tend to all be familiar with when you go out and uh, drink, or what's been offered now in pubs, is a lot more. If you think of the glass of wine that you get if you go to a restaurant or um, or even at home, the glasses tend to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, just be aware that alcohol is a stimulant. So if you're having trouble with high pouch output, you probably get um, you know, worsening symptoms and, and looser output. So just be aware of that. Um, with regards to individual foods and pouch function, um, individual tolerances will sort of vary considerably. So it's important to try and identify on a trial and error basis foods that are best tolerated for you. Um, and as we said, try and eat a, a varied and balanced diet as much as possible based on the work plate that we've seen before. And only try and avoid foods that are causing unpleasant symptoms for you. Uh, so don't just try and exclude foods uh, because of someone else is doing that and it's working for them because what works for one doesn't mean that it's going to work for another person. You have to try and see what your, what your body accepts and what works for you. It, try and introduce one, uh, one new food at a time so that you can figure out sort of what's causing what. Um, and just be aware that tolerance to certain foods will change over time. So something that might upset you as soon as you had your pouch doesn't mean that that will be the case later down as the pouch adapts and becomes more, more established. So keep retesting foods over time because your tolerance might change. Um, food and symptom diaries might be useful to help you identify links between different foods and symptoms and find your own tolerances and intolerances. Um, so there's different foods that affect the, the pouch output uh, differently. Things like starchy foods, Things like potatoes, pasta, rice, bread, bananas as well tend to thicken the output, tend to help thicken the output. Uh, but foods, on the other hand, such as uh, chocolate or rot fruit and vegetables, uh, highly spiced foods, a lot of greasy or fatty foods, um, sugar foods, leafy green vegetables, they might make the output more loose. Um, so just be, be aware of those. And this table pretty much summarizes some of the most common symptoms that people with pouches might get and the foods that tend to be related to uh, those symptoms. We discussed about foods that can increase or decrease the stool output, respectively. Um, but with regards to sort of anal irritation, that might be an issue for some people. Uh, things like <coughs> spicy foods or nuts, seeds, citrus fruits, raw fruit and vegetables might sort of um, exacerbate an, uh, the irritation. Um, gas producing vegetables like broccoli, sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, onion, and garlic, beans, and again spicy foods, uh, beer and uh, fizzy drinks might increase wind. Uh, so you might just be aware if you're troubled by wind that some of those things might be, you might need to limit them. Um, and things like fish, onion, garlic and eggs can uh, increase the um, stool odour. So the, the eating pattern also seems to be affecting the pouch function. So we're moving away from individual foods, and now we're looking at sort of the our eating pattern as a whole. Um, with the sort of busy lifestyles that we all seem to live uh, nowadays, we see more and more people skipping meals and not following a regular eating pattern. However, erratic eating often leads to an erratic bowel habit. So it's important to try and follow a regular eating pattern and avoid skipping meals. Um, some uh, people have identified that stool output tends to be greater after a main meal, after a bigger meal. So um, you might, it might be worth experimenting with the timing and size of your meals. 
some people find they tolerate better having the main meal earlier in the day, so at lunchtime, and then have something lighter in the evening, or uh, avoid eating late at night, maybe have your evening meal a bit earlier on to, to try and prevent emptying the pouch overnight. Um, and again, keep a, a diary to sort of evaluate meal and pouch pattern and see what works for you best. Um, I just want to focus a little bit more on the nighttime stool frequency because it, it is a common problem and it can be disruptive uh, for most patients, especially on their sleep patterns. More than 50% of people with pouches tend to wake up during the night at least once or twice to pass a stool. And this can be related to obviously as we said, eating late or overeating, uh, having larger portions during, uh, late uh, at night or eating foods that are known to cause problems. So um, try not to eat too late try and wait at least three to four hours after your last meal before uh, going to bed. Um, try and control your portion sizes uh, at dinner so don't overeat um, uh, in the evening meal. Uh, it might be worth uh, experimenting and taking antidiarrheal medication before going to bed if, if an overactive pouch overnight is, is an issue for you. And um, try and eat more of the binding foods, so the starch carbohydrates, to, to uh, help thicken the output and avoid those foods that tend to sort of uh, cause diarrhea and uh, increase the output. Now, fatigue is another common problem, especially after having uh, an ileal pouch um, a procedure, because it is a, a major operation. Uh, nighttime stool frequency can also contribute to, to fa fatigue, so it's recommended that you just take it easy and allow plenty of, of rest during your recovery. Um, if you wake up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, uh, you might need to just allow for a longer uh, sleep period. And to help you recover, I know it sounds strange, but keep busy. <laughs> so don't try and stay at home because you're having more bowel movements. So more people found that they, when they're out of the house, they don't have as many uh, bowel movements during the day, but they, they tend to have more bowel movements when they get home in the, in the evening. Um, the other thing to sort of think about is potentially starting a regular exercise program, walking, swimming, or uh, playing a sport. Do something that um, satisfies you and interests you. Because um, with, with exercise, you get the happy hormones, the endorphins, and that can help with your energy levels and take you out of that loop of feeling more and more tired. Um, many people tend to get frustrated about their, their progress after surgery and want sort of a, a quicker recovery and get back on track fairly, fairly quickly. But remember that this is an operation, this is a major operation, and you will need time to, to feel better. So uh, try and be a bit patient and give yourself time to recover. And um, finally, um, Pachitis, um, which is a pouch dysfunction sort of disorder, this is an acute or chronic inflammation of the pouch, causing symptoms like diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, bleeding, incontinence, um, and the incidence is reported between 15 to 44 percent um, in the uh, in the pouch population. It's usually treated with a two-week course of antibiotics, but it can sometimes uh, some people tend to need longer. Uh, courses of antibiotics. There is emerging evidence regarding the use of uh, probiotics, especially specific strains uh, including Bifidobacterium, Lactobacillus, Streptococcus. Um, I don't know if you've, you, if you've heard about uh, this probiotic BSL3, uh, if, you, if you are familiar with it. It, it is the most, uh, is the strongest uh, probiotic that is out there in the market at the moment, and it's the most heavily researched one as well. It comes in a preparation of three to six grams, and uh, evidence shows that uh, using probiotics can prevent the initial onset of pachitis after you, you have your pouch formed, and may also prevent relapse of recurrent pachitis. So um, it's something to consider if you're, if you're struggling with uh, pachitis. So I guess the, the take home message uh, from uh, this talk today is to try and adopt a regular eating pattern, avoid skipping meals. Eat a, as varied and as well-balanced diet as you can based on the health eating principles, um, depending on your pouch function. Try and consume meals slowly and take your time through meals, don't rush through meals and try and, and, and uh, chew your food well. Drink plenty of fluids 
um, and have extra salt, especially during episodes of high output. Again, we might need to consider oral hydration solutions or certain medication to help um, reduce the output if that is the case. And um, in summary, the, the long-term aim is to promote a, a balanced diet to prevent nutritional deficiencies and maintain a healthy weight One, to try and keep yourself as, as sort of fit as possible. Remember that intolerances to certain foods will vary between individuals and will also vary over time as well. So keep retesting things to find your own um, tolerances and intolerances. And um, specific symptoms might be reduced by avoiding specific, specific foods, but only do that if you've identified a link to certain foods. Don't just try and necessarily avoid um, certain food groups. Try and see what works for you and what doesn't work for you and how your body responds to it. Thank you. So that's basically, as we said, fruit and vegetables are an important source of vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, so it's important to, to give that to your body, as well as a good source of fiber. When you don't have any, when you don't have a problematic pouch, you don't have a high output pouch, and you're, you, know, you're, you have a more of a sort of normal bowel pattern, there's no need to avoid fiber. You need fiber generally, and you need fruit and vegetables to get all the vitamins and minerals and make sure that you, you're getting the bacterial fermentation, creating all these good byproducts that um, help uh, to, to have a healthy uh, bowel, healthy gut. But it, there, there are some cases with people with pouches that do have a very active pouch. In that situation, the advice is to try and limit the fiber a bit and try and limit the raw fruit and vegetables. Um, so if they have a very limited intake of fruit and vegetables, then they might need to be supplemented with multivitamins or, you know, complete multivitamins to make sure that they're not missing any of the vitamins and minerals so that they have a more of a, a, a balanced diet. There's a lady um, you mentioned about avoiding certain foods. Um, I mean, uh, Initially, yeah. It's, I think, generally, because initially, the, you have a newly formed pouch. It hasn't particularly, you know, it takes a bit of time to start working properly and start doing it, its, its job. So, um, first of all, what we want to try and avoid is having any blockages. So, as you said, it's the consistency of the skins, the seats, the pips that can cause that or um, try and um, it can actually... Um, prevent the, the wound from, from healing or um, disturb any surgical sort of um, uh, anastomosis. But um, it's also until your bowel starts sort of working normally again, it's probably best to try not to give it a lot of fiber at that stage. Um, allow it to start, because eventually you probably have a very high output pouch to start with anyway. So giving it a, m more fiber to process through at that point will probably make you go more time. So you probably have a higher pouch output soon after surgery, and then over time it will eventually start slowing down. Um, and that's why the losses be the first six to eight weeks are higher in terms of fluid and salt, because you tend to have a, a higher pouch output. So it's probably worth not giving it a lot of fiber during those initial few weeks until it starts adapting and um, be, you know, coming to more of a normal sort of bowel pattern. So, soluble fiber tends to be, I guess, a bit easier to, although it's very tricky, it's very tri tricky to have foods that are purely soluble fiber and purely insoluble fiber. Now we're kind of moving away from those sort of terms because you, you probably get foods that have a bit of both. So it's very difficult to then sort of differentiate. But um, it tends to be a bit easier to, to tolerate, so it might not be such of an issue. It, it tends to be the insoluble fiber things with skins and seeds and pips that seems to be the problem. 
um, initially. So, um, but generally, the idea is that you should be, and you hopefully will be able to reintroduce fiber after the initial uh, <coughs> few weeks as your pouch adapts. So the aim is to try and get you back to that eat well plate and making sure that you have uh, foods from all the different food groups, including fruit and vegetables, including fiber. But uh, as I said, it's, it's important to try and, and aim you know, for a, a more of a as, as well-balanced and as well-varied diet as much as you can. People that, and that's why it's become, it becomes so individual, because you might get people with pouches that can eat nuts and seeds and, and raw fruit and vegetables and salads, and it doesn't necessarily affect their pouch function as much. <coughs> you get other people where they are troubled by very high output uh, pouch and they those are the ones that need to be a bit more careful and start making adjustments and limiting fiber and fruit and vegetables. Yeah. Well some of some of the vitamins and minerals will be obviously um, lost the more processing you do to, to fruit and vegetables. Uh, but the thing is that you won't necessarily lose the fiber. The fiber will stay in the pulp. So even if you do um, liquidize them, you still you still get uh, unless you start you know you just have the clear juice and try and avoid the pulp, you still get the fiber. But um, you know fiber is not the enemy. Basically, it's not. <laughs> it's it's only in certain situations where people are troubled with uh, a very high output pouch and um, and having a lot of fiber then will probably stimulate the gut even more and create. Uh, more of a high output pouch. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. I mean,